What's up, everyone? Really excited to get through this on the section number three, the letter C in hacking. We already went over the first two sections of the house hacking uh, course. So H and A have already been covered where it covers like the house itself, what is house hacking, to A being the financials and analyzing your financials, C being choose the right property. I'm gonna go over the table of comp contents of what we're gonna go over. Really excited to go through this. So uh, that being said, C, choosing the right property. Number one, first chapter, Evaluating the neighborhoods, very important. Property types for house hacking, key features to look for in a property, making an offer and negotiating, and inspection and due diligence. Like I said, really good information here. I feel like this is the bread and butter of what people wanna see, more tactical. And when people are scouring the MLS, this is what they wanna see. So uh, great timing and in terms of trying to find the right property. This is the right spot. That's me. You've probably seen me in other places, especially the first two chapters. Um, I love my almond croissants. This is definitely key. <laughs> That's definitely me. <laughs> um, this is a really important quote. Educating yourself is important, but implementation is power. I can show you how to do everything in house hacking, but it does not matter until you actually implement it. Knowledge is power. But uh, or knowledge is information, but implementation is power, in my opinion. So um, let's get right into it. Evaluating the neighborhoods. My favorite Grant Cardone quote. He's a very polarizing man. And for those of you who don't know Grant Cardone, he's a multi-billion dollar person, uh, real estate mogul, commercial space, uh, real estate investor, um, and uh, larger than life kind of personality. So um, yeah, uh, whether you like him or you hate him, he has very good information in investing, especially in real estate. So my favorite quote from him, if it's easy to buy, it's hard to sell. And if it's hard to buy, it's easy to sell. For example, cash flowing homes in the Midwest are easy to buy. And why are they easy to buy? I mean, a lot of people out there or that look to the Midwest, try to look for cash flow. They try to like get in as soon as possible and get in with as little capital as possible. So when it's easy to buy, especially in these Midwest home places, they, it becomes hard to sell because eventually when you try to sell this place, you realize that there's not many buyers that want to take on this property unless it's like cash flowing pretty significantly, right? So usually when it's easy to buy, there's no competition, it's an affordable price, um, maybe the seller just wants to get rid of it and we'll make all these accommodations for you, the buyer, to be able to purchase it and finance it. So there's a lot more to meets the eye than just a low purchase price, high cash flow kind of property. At the same time, a high demand home is hard to buy. If it's hard to buy where you get like several offers and you have competition and you are in a bidding war and you have to negotiate with the seller in terms of what gets fixed or replaced in the inspection, all that good stuff. If you finally hit the finish line and you close on the property, you will find it to be easy to sell because a whole bunch of people will find it very attractive, whether it's in a great location or um, the high appreciation is there your return on investment will be significantly easier or better when you try to sell the property because over time, in a high demand place, the appreciation just slowly creeps up and at a higher rate than those that are in the Midwest or places that are not as desirable. So really love that quote by Grant Cardone. Um, definitely holds true for my portfolio. So going on to fit the strategy, you need to know what what strategy you want to actually use for your house hack or your investment property, whatever it might be. You need to know what the strategy is and how you can properly utilize it within the uh, Denver area, right? Or nationwide even. So first things first, a really good metric for you to find the right property and choose the right property is the school district. And a lot of people harp on that, especially if they were to even just move to a good location or a different location. They look at the school district. And why is that? Usually means it's family friendly. And with family friendly, it goes to a point of, uh, you know, there's a lot of parks, there's a lot of 
things going on for the kids. Um, and it's a safe place for people to raise their kids. And that's, that's why it's still pretty sought after, right? More money coming in for the city and neighborhood. Usually property taxes are a little bit higher, but with that, the roads are better. The, um, the police force is some, I mean, one can only assume that the police force is better and things like that. There's more resources for the community to use within the better school districts. Foster's a strong community, have a lot of community events, volunteer happenings and, um, you know, uh, charity events and things like that. And of course, quality of education. So with the quality of education, you get better workforce, you get people coming out of it with um, a better education and um, yeah, just quality people, assumedly. So fitting the strategy even more, if you're planning a short-term rental, this is specific for short-term rentals, right? And this is a great looking short-term rental, which is why I uh, put it here. Does the area allow STRs? That's the first and foremost, right? Like if, if you're in the city of Denver and you want to have a short-term rental, that is pretty much not applicable or cannot happen unless you live in the property for more than 100 days out of the year. It has to be considered your primary residence. If you want to have it operated as an investment property and you want to have it as an STR, that is definitely not possible. Um, they will find out and they will take down your listing and or fine you. So I would highly suggest that you just keep that in mind um, for your future uh, short-term rental. Um, is there any uh, limitations with these uh, short-term rentals? Like, for example, Arvada and Wheat Ridge, I think just Arvada actually. Arvada allows you to have a short-term rental as an investment property, but it only allows you to have it occupied as a short-term rental for about 66% of the year. So only one third has to be vacant. So that being said, that's actually pretty normal for a short-term rental. I know with my place, my short-term rental, it's about 70-ish percent. So it's not that far off from that number. You're not going to be getting 100% occupancy unless you have dirt cheap um, you know, per night stays. So is the neighborhood in a tourist or otherwise attractive area? You know, a lot of people come to, let's say, the Denver area so that they can go out to the mountains, stay in the city, go to Boulder, Golden, whatever it might be, or see some sort of event, right? Um, so if you're in the city of Denver and you're, let's say you're close to Ball Arena and the playoffs are happening and there's a huge Nuggets fan coming into town and they want to stay at your Airbnb, that's a great location. Um, it's very attractive and there's a lot of things to do outside of the basketball games, right? Um, if you're kind of in a rural area and not much is happening and there's no conventions around, there's no events happening, it's going to be kind of tough for you to convince someone to stay at your place. So you do want to make sure that you have all those accommodations and possibilities happen for people to want to stay at your place. And lastly, does the neighborhood have an HOA? It's not going to be completely barring from you being available to do an STR, like being within an HOA community, but chances are you're going to have a lot more red tape for you to uh, have that operation happen within that community. So make sure you know that. Next, fit the strategy. Moving on from short-term rentals, we have midterm and long-term rentals. They are 30 plus day stays. And this is the bread and butter and what people are used to. At least that's what LTRs are. And I went over that on a previous um, a section, I think on the first section. Uh, and MTRs is the medium term rentals where you have it furnished. You furnish the common areas with TVs. Um, you have towels for the uh, bathrooms. You pretty much set everything up for the guest, right? And I have a snapshot here of Furnished Finder, and it has great stats for midterm rentals. And Denver has some really good numbers for midterm rentals. So um, that being said, let's get into the strategy. So if the city is short-term rental restrictive, MTRs and LTRs are good options. I mean, the main restrictions that these neighborhoods or cities or towns have is that like it's 29 or less days. That's usually defined as a short-term rental, right? Midterm rentals are 30 plus day stays. So they're good options. And usually uh, neighborhoods and cities, they're completely fine with that because that is what they're used to with typical renters in the area. If there's a major employer or lots of construction in the area, MTRs and LTRs are great. Um, 
I currently have a a uh, group of guys that are working on a construction job over in the Westminster area. And they worked with me on finding a great price for them for four weeks. Like the whole month is all booked and that is all set. So now I'm trying to figure out where they came from and who they work for so I can get more of their workforce to stay with me because they're awesome tenants. They stay, they work for 12 hours a day and they only come back home to like shower and sleep. So I want more of that. <laughs> so if people are, they need to relocate in the area, that's another great option to find uh, renters for your MTRs or LTRs. And if you're managing it and you don't want to use the brain power, here I am with a short term rental and sure I'm a real estate professional and I'm able to manage the property, get, um, you know, uh, proper inquiries all settled and answered and have the automated messaging and all that good stuff. But at a certain point, like if I could get a maybe slightly lower per month amount of income, but I dedicate less amount of brain power for it, I think that's going to be a win. So um, I do want to make sure that that's a, uh, a good option. So um, yeah, it's great. Short term rentals. Major cities, attractions, Red Rocks, theme parks, those like that's Denver specific, sure. But you do want to attract the certain type of person that would be staying based on your strategy, right? So major cities, attractions, theme parks, conventions, and I would possibly include, um, you know, like uh, closer to the city life, right? And then we get into MTRs, LTRs, families, business executives, traveling nurses, grad students, um, and even just um, college students or people like young professionals that's included in the LTR strategy. Um, yeah, definitely know who you're attracting and make sure you have amenities there that attract that type of guest. Now on to number two, property types for house hacking. Um, this will go mainly into like the types of houses and what strategy you want to use. The the cheap previous like section or chapter was just like the overarching view of where. This is now the how, right? So property type. Um, over here, I guess I, I really like this um graphic here so we have detached single family houses and then the missing middle this is this is what i like to harp on in in, in in terms of getting more housing within the city of denver or colorado or metropolitan cities right a lot of times we just see these detached single family homes and apartment complexes this is the missing middle housing and there is, I, I don't know if it is Opticos, but there's um, a movement happening uh, nationwide where they're trying to uh, develop more of these houses that are just not as prevalent as detached single family homes and apartment complexes. So uh, if you want to talk about that later, we definitely can. But for the purpose of this presentation, let's go over the property types for house hacking. Single family homes. Midterm rentals, LTRs, and rent by the rooms are great and possibly short term rentals. But the reason why I put a minus there for short term rental is because not every place is viable for short term rentals. So uh, even though it might give you the most bang for your buck, especially per night, um, you're just limited in terms of location. And a lot of metropolitan cities are cracking down on that information. Now we go into the missing middle, right? We got duplexes, fourplexes, courtyard buildings, cottage courts, townhomes, medium, multiplexes, triplexes, and then going on forward, right? So STR, MTR, LTR, rent by the room, all of it is very applicable in these places because a lot of the uh, cities, neighborhoods, all that good stuff, when they see a duplex and you're living in one half of the house or like one of the units compared to the two, um, chances are you're going to be taking care of that home as if it is your property. And so if you're taking care of it as if it's your property, then the issues of a short term rental where like there's parties, there's trash everywhere, there's noise ordinances that have to be implemented, things like that, that is less likely to happen. So um, that's why STRs are now moved up to the plus side as pros with the duplex through quadplex. 
But Ian, what if I want to find a duplex, but they're so hard to find? Well, we'll get to that later. So this is very good. That's a very good question, um, but we'll get to that. And lastly, we have condos and townhomes. Usually they're good for short-term rentals, mid-term rentals, and rent by the room. As far as profit goes, it will depend on where this is because there are HOAs or some sort of like, um, yeah, I guess HOAs that prevent STRs, but due to the lower price point, STRs can work pretty well. And usually these guys are in the middle of the city or closer to attractions that attract tourists. So I'm putting the STR back into the plus section. Just make sure you do your due diligence on where it is and whether the zoning is allowed, right? LTRs, not very good. You're not going to get the biggest bang for your buck with a long-term rental strategy. Um, it's just a lower price point, the lower amount of rent coming in. It just kind of sucks. Um, so that being said, I'll just leave it at that. Property types. Let's get into more detail, more approachable and plentiful. There's a lot of single family homes out there. I mean, everyone knows them. Everyone, uh, I mean, yeah, it's a house, you know, they're everywhere. And it, it seems pretty typical for these single family homes to, um, you know, it's on Zillow, it's on realtor.com. You, you drive by dozens, if not hundreds of them every single day. So they're the most approachable and most approachable and plentiful. Uh, it can be in an HOA. It can be a pro or con, and that all depends on your strategy. If it's a long-term rental, it could be a pro because now HOA just makes sure that everything is all upkept. The common areas are good to go. Uh, it could be a con because, hey, maybe the, the juice is not worth the squeeze, right? Where you have to pay like quarterly or monthly for the HOA fees, and then eventually um, it just does not work out because they are way too nitpicky on who gets to be renting out your place, right? SDRs may not be allowed, uh, especially for the single, single family homes. Like I said, depends on location. Higher appreciation versus the condos. And uh, duplexes and quadplexes, we'll get down to that. But um, yeah, I just wanted to say that on the long-term investment perspective, single family homes do have that higher appreciation rate. Duplexes and quadplexes, most dynamic with the strategies that we mentioned before. Um, with, with duplexes and quadplexes, short-term, long-term, mid-term, and also run by the room strategies are very viable. Most sought after, which means pricey. More demand, and that means the sellers and the owners can have a higher purchase price because more people are willing to spend more money for that same duplex. So, and going back to the Grant Cardone quote, right? Because it's sought after, the sellers have an easier time to sell, but it's tough for the buyer to buy due to the competition and higher purchase price of a duplex. So I th thanks Grant Cardone for giving me that uh, little piece of good information and good quote. Limited in, limited in number, right? So you're not going to be seeing as many duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, in the general area of where you live, right? Very good information to know because with that higher demand and that limited number, it increases the demand for it and would possibly go into multiple bidding wars versus a typical single family home. Going into town, <laughs> I am not a condo and townhome. I'll move my face over here. Condos and townhomes, most likely in an HOA, most likely also STR friendly, maybe not. I It will depend on the HOA. Very convenient and in major cities. Um, like I said, tourism is a plenty in a lot of these metropolitan cities. A lot of events happen, conventions happen and things like that. So these townhomes and condos are very popular. So um, it's great for, let's say, even midterm rentals for those business executives or grad students that just need to stay for, yeah, a convention or something like that. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's good in that regard. Likely not worth the long-term rental, which is why I put that minus LTR and plus everything else on that previous slide. Usually it's not worth the long-term rental. Slower appreciation as well. So because it is an attached home, not a detached home, like a single family home, 
it has slower appreciation. It's just not as attractive as a single family home. I mean, the American dream, <laughs> I mean, my American dream is getting financially free as soon as possible. But the American dream is white picket fence. You got the big old backyard. You got the three bed, two bath, pitched roof, all that good stuff. And that does not look like a condo. So <laughs> lower barrier to entry, which is by price. And that is definitely true. Um, you're looking at what, at least in the Denver area, uh, 150 grand more affordable than a single family home. So you can get into the game much faster um, with a condo or town home. So now, now that we've established where we can do the house hacking and uh, what to look for like on a more macro scale, and we've seen uh, what types of property to use based on the strategy you want to use. We now want to look at the key features to look for in the specific property. Let's say you're on Zillow or something like that, and you see a property, hey, this looks great. This looks beautiful. But you need to know whether it's conducive for the strategy. So rent by the room, single family home. What do you look for? If it's six plus bedrooms, you got to have two kitchens. Um, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves in this, but I do want to mention that this is very important for those that are looking to the rent by the room strategy. And the reason why I harp on this strategy a little bit more than the typical strategy is because for those of you that are willing to sacrifice your personal space, maybe a little bit more inconvenience in order to make more profit, rent by the room is a great strategy. So with rent by the room, if you have six plus bedrooms, Two kitchens is super important, or at least like a kitchenette or maybe even two to three refrigerators and things like that. Um, and it's just way more attractive to have it that way and a lot less animosity. Two fridges, mention that oversized basement to create another room. I love to see this in a listing photo to accommodate for another room here. I mean, look at all this space that could be a living room. However, if you were to section off the wall, maybe put in a couple more outlets, put in heating and an egress window, you can make that money up, that money dedicated to creating the, the second room in the basement or the next room in the basement is gonna be well worth your time. You're probably gonna get that paid back within the first year. And imagine holding onto the property for five years, you're gonna like 400% that return on investment. Super important. I love to see the two bed, one bath ratio. If you are seeing a three bed to one bath ratio, it is not very attractive. Um, that's where the animosity kind of comes into. You wanna make sure the chemistry within the house becomes way, it becomes better. Like you, you always want to improve on the chemistry within the house, right? Because when you have several people living under one roof, um, chemistry tends to not be there. It, it does depend on the person. Maybe you have great screening opportunities, but you do want to make sure that it's um, as cooperative as possible. So these are great videos. Oh yeah. So this is like one of the, my first videos. So bear with me on the quality and stuff like that. But Max has an awesome rent by the room strategy over in the Aurora area. Um, yeah, I think it's like a seven bedroom and he made it an eight bedroom by converting the basement into one more bedroom. So he's making like 5,400 a month on the place. Um, very attractive. And, uh, he does a lot of good, um, tactics and strategies to make that work for him. Different Max. <laughs> uh, he's over in the city of Denver area. He's making thirty-five fifty a month. And that's his plan, uh, especially when he moves out. I think so. And I think his, uh, if I remember the video correctly, that's about his mortgage. So with that being his mortgage, he's living for free in the property. So I think he's trying to make it a six bedroom place with three bathrooms. Um, yeah, it, it seems to be a really good um, way for people to, you know, have a rent by the room strategy. Go check them out on my YouTube channel. I do full uh, vlog tours of them. So here's an example of a good rent by the room uh, strategy house. And how can I tell already, right? The things, I mean, I see the five bedroom, which is okay, right? But what really sets me off is this square footage, 4,000 square feet. Like just to give you a comparison, right? 
I have a four bed, two bath, um, short term rental, and it is about two thousand square feet, twenty one hundred square feet max. This is four thousand square feet. Like I would anticipate that you could put in two more beds and maybe one more bath to get that two to one ratio of beds to baths to make this an awesome rent by the room strategy. And having seven bedrooms is pretty clutch, um, especially if you're getting, let's say, $800 a month per bedroom on average, 800 times seven bedrooms, you're looking at 5,600 per month. And chances are that is exceeding what your mortgage looks like. So single family homes, what's it look for? With this short term rental strategy, you're looking at a little bit of a different strategy here, right? This is Danielle, I toured her property um, not too long ago over the summer of 2024 and she has a sweet setup. I mean, it's close to Denver Wash Park, like West Wash Park area and um, she has this lock off door where she could separate the basement dwellers from her living situation. And so that's what I like to look for for my client's house hacks if they're looking to do this short-term rental strategy. That way they're not interacting with them um, often or at all, honestly. So separate entrance to the basement, that's Danielle's strategy. I'll go into future videos or videos that you should look at um, in order to uh, see it on a more tactical perspective and like as an investment property tour. There's a kitchen, <coughs> excuse me, kitchen or kitchenette in the basement um, in order to accommodate so like food or like um, sinkware, things like that. And then STR approved city or neighborhood. So Danielle, with her being in the city of Denver, um, she needed to apply for a short-term rental license and have someone uh, live in the short-term rental downstairs while she lives upstairs. Um, sounds like it's not that difficult in order to get one. I have not gotten one myself, but my clients have and Danielle has. And she says that she's able to navigate the whole thing. Um, if you are curious on what her information is, I can definitely give that to you. Uh, eventually get into that um, type of strategy. Want to make more money? Live in the basement. Uh, that's what Kat and I did. We lived in the basement and uh, operated the main floor as a short-term rental. I mean, people would technically, or not technically, people would love to stay in the main house on the main floor rather than stay in a basement. I think it's just like more natural light coming in, um, more of a flow to the kitchen and uh, I guess no stairs have like, you're not having to worry about stairs and things like that. So I would say live in the basement, make more money, have the main floor operate as a short term rental. So I did a, uh, tour of, uh, Daniel's place, really cool place. Uh, ignore this typo right here. 40 K per month. It's 40 K per year. <laughs> That's a lot of money, 40 K per month. And I'm pretty sure she would not be working if that was the case, but uh, that's a typo. Uh, Dean's Airbnb house in Inglewood. I also did an investment property tour there and he did some really cool improvements for having a washer dryer uh, hookups in the basement and also in the main floor. So he goes through some of the numbers there and how it has been operating and uh, why he decided to design it um, or hire someone to design it and not design it himself. So, um, and it's very dog friendly. Uh, I think what's, uh, you know, you, you got to find that niche, right? And uh, that's, that's a very smart way for Dean to make more money on the place. So with all these improvements that I have been mentioning so far, as far as like creating a separate bedroom or uh, creating a separate entrance for the short term rental, or maybe even creating hookups for uh, the washer dryer upstairs and, and also downstairs in the basement. Uh, there are some improvements that you can do on your house hack in order to make it that much more showable, which means you can charge more rent and you'll get more applicants coming into your property. So let's go in through this, right? Minor bathroom remodel, new vanity, regalize the tub, improve the lighting and new tile. That is very attractive. I mean, bathrooms can get outdated pretty quickly, but with a three quarters bath and new tile and maybe even a new toilet, um, that is all way, like that's your biggest return on investment here. Upgraded landscaping, mulch, xeriscape, drought friendly items. There was even a place that I toured yesterday with my clients um, 
it was like a big old yard. It was a corner house, so the yard like wrapped around to uh, you know the opposite side or the the other street, right? The other intersection of the street. And what they did was instead of like having grass everywhere, there was grass everywhere. I looked at the before pictures, but what they did was they ripped out the perimeter um, grass, like closer to the driveway and also to the sidewalk and bordering the street as well. They ripped off the perimeter of that and they put in rocks and some mulch as well. So it's just a lot more friendly for water usage and it, it, it just looks better in my opinion as well because in a way, Denver is more of a desert than it is, let's say, with a lot of rain or a lot of snow and things like that. There's just not many rainy days or snowy days like throughout the year. So why not make that work for you and have a lower water bill and still look pretty at the same time. So one last thing I'll say on that, I feel like I'm harping on it a little bit more, but upgrading the landscaping too will make it easier to sell. Uh, a lot of people love that curb appeal and I feel like that can work to your advantage if you were to have upgraded landscaping. Minor kitchen remodel. This is so good too. The bathrooms and the kitchens inside the home are the biggest ROIs. And so you want to stick to cosmetic things in order to get you the biggest ROI. I mean, a complete gut of the kitchen, I guess, is not a bad idea. It's just when you have a limited amount of resources and a limited amount of um, money along with it, like time, effort, money, um, you kind of just want to stick to cosmetic things. Let's say cabinets, new countertop, things like that, right? So make it work for you with your budget and even just small improvements, even just replacing the appliances, let's say even having a gas stove versus an electric one, a lot of people prefer the gas stove. Now going on to exterior improvements, fresh outdoor paint really makes it pop within the neighborhood. Um, I'd say it's well worth the money getting in these this uh, fresh outdoor paint going. Um, it definitely is attractive, and I've done that with my duplex over in San Diego. New steel door, very attractive, attractive as well. Uh, more insulation, and it has that weight to it, you know? Uh, feels more secure. And then anything improving the curb appeal, which includes the landscaping on the previous slide. Um, first impressions are everything. And it goes to houses as well as people. I'll leave it at that. Got to know the market. I mean, it, the longer you stay, I mean, I guess this is the only time where I would recommend staying uh, on the sidelines for as long as you want. <laughs> but when you look at all these properties in various different locations, um, that could be a bad thing. When you see properties within the same zip code, and you see how the market is performing, whether, like over the course of six months, um, you see what the price points are going for, what the condition of the home and how that's been operating and things like that, uh, based on beds, baths, and square footage. That is all super useful for when you finally hit the market as a potential buyer, you're like, okay, this is a sweet deal. I think you can work that to your advantage when the time comes. You got to know the market. And sure, you can base your information on the realtor, but in the end, you're purchasing the property, right? The realtor can just give them, give you all the information in the world, but you need to verify on your time and with your knowledge base as well. So we're going to go through the pass, P-S-A-S or P-A-S-S of what kind of things you got to look for in the market, right? What do the home prices look like in the area? Keeping track of how the prices fluctuate means you can take advantage of an undervalued home. Super true. I mean, there was that previous slide that we had earlier with the five bed, three bath, 4,000 square feet place. That is an undervalued home and just way too much living space for you to not take advantage as a rent by the room strategy, right? So prices, definitely keep that in mind. Know the typical square footage of the home. Adding bedrooms or a second unit can be easy when there's enough room. So there's another situation where you can have a junior ADU or an attached ADU based on the layout of the house. So let's say you have the layout of the house, but at the edge of the house is a master or a uh, primary bedroom and bathroom, right? When you have a primary bed and bath and it's sort of separated from the rest of the house, 
what if you just took that bed and bath and extended that into a, another unit? Make another bathroom, make a kitchenette, and extend the square footage of the house, have some proper heating and things like that. That way, people can have a easier way to get into the home and you only share one wall at a very affordable price. So all of that being said, there's so many ways for you to make uh, money on the property. You just got to know the market, right? Amenities nearby or in the listing. If you're in a neighborhood with pools, does the home have a pool as well? Is there a detached garage, etc.? There's a lot of good information here. And uh, yesterday when I was doing some showings, proximity to the area of Old Town, Arvada was very necessary for my clients uh, or something very, um, you know, uh, substitution, you know, uh, <laughs> comparative, uh, comparable to the Old Town Arvada feel. For example, Old Town Arvada has like Chick-fil-A, Home Depot, Costco, Michaels, um, indoor uh, skydiving. I mean, just a whole bunch of cool stuff around it, right? And having amenities close by to the home improves the value of the home and improves the demand of the home as well. Last thing, what happens to the neighborhood per season? Are mountain towns favorable in the winter? Um, how about fall or even the summer? It all depends on where you're trying to go and also what kind of renters you're trying to attract. For example, let's say you do take, a, take advantage of a mountain town, uh, let's say like Breckenridge or Frisco or something like that. Let's say, let's say Frisco. A long-term rental is not very viable. Because usually people in Frisco, where you're very close to Silverthorne, um, resorts, uh, people that want to do these like snowboarding activities, winter activities, and things like that, when you have a long-term rental in there or like you try to operate as a long-term rental, the, it just means they have to stay for more than months at a time. Usually it's a six-month or 12-month lease. I don't know anyone that would stay there for that long um, at least off the, off the top of my head, right? But if you were to operate it as a short-term rental or a mid-term rental where you got, let's say, ski, ski uh, instructors or snowboard instructors wanting to stay there during the winter season, that is very accommodating. I think that's a very smart move. Um, Long-term rentals where people are actually moving there, considering Frisco their home, is not as popular. And the people that would be wanting to live there usually are very affluent and they have a lot of cash to spend and they're of a different clientele. So that being said, you got to know what your market is like in different seasons. Um, I know greater Metro Denver area very well in the different seasons, not so much in the mountain towns. And I would highly suggest working with a realtor that has that knowledge base. Now onto making an offer and negotiating the fun part, right? So First things first, and before we can even make an offer, we got to see the place. We got to show the home. So this is a snapshot of one of the reels that I did where um, Anne uh, bought a place over in Aurora, and it was a five-bedroom, four-bath place or six-bedroom, four-bath place, and she converted it into a seven-bedroom, four-bath place. And so she extended, or sorry, she closed off one of the living rooms or maybe even a dining room and have, has that now operating as a bedroom. So <laughs> I don't know why exactly, maybe there's a snapshot, snapshot here where uh, it gives me the reason why I put the snapshot, but nonetheless. Showing the home, I realized, at least for me personally, five houses in one day is a lot. And unless you're taking notes and maybe even video recordings of each of the houses, I would say that even five is kind of pushing it as far as like remembering what house, like, well, oftentimes when I leave a house, I, I'm often like, is that the one with uh, the new appliances? Is like the one with the new appliances did that have the detached garage or was that the one with the attached garage where... I'm like, it's on the opposite side of the house, right? And you start, try to start remembering it, but the listing photos are not conducive of that kind of like mental 
um, hopscotch, right? So five houses per day is usually the max that I like to recommend for my clients. Um, if you're recording and um, taking notes, maybe you could do more, but five houses is very mentally draining as well. And uh, yeah, just want to make sure that you're fresh per house and giving each one of them a fair shot. Get the general flow and strategy of the home. You're not looking too in depth of the house when you're showing it. This is before any offers are made. This is for you to see like what the neighborhood is like, get a general feel for it. Um, my clients yesterday when we were doing some showings, we liked the general area and we liked the feel of the house and the upgrades and the updates and things like that and the landscaping. And so that being said, the inspections and the due diligence part will happen after an offer is sent in. Confirm the layout based on your strategy. Make sure you go check that out. Peek at the roof, water pressure, cell reception, all of that's super important. We can get into the nitty gritty when it comes into the inspection part of the house. Um, so yeah, just, just get a general idea and see everything with your own eyes before a professional comes in. Inspect the HVAC, water heater condition, um, this is very important stuff as well, uh, because this is often big ticket items. HVAC is like what, 15, maybe 20 K depending on the age of it. Uh, water heater condition, you know, you're looking at what, 1500 to $2,000, um, depending on the water heater, the style, the length of life on it. But yeah, just go check it out. Um, I have a general idea of what the age looks like and the condition of it. I'm by no means a professional with this, like plumbing or HVAC, but I do have an idea. If you're 75% sure that on the place, I would say put in an offer. And with that offer, you could put in terms and prices that you would feel comfortable with if you were to close on the place. But um, until that point, you just got to make sure that with the strategy you're trying to use, the quality of life, all of that is about 75% sure with everything in mind. So what is an offer? Like, what, what, what does that even mean? So an offer is a contract to buy and sell real estate, at least within the state of Colorado. That's what it's called. Your intent to buy the home. You want to buy the home and this is what the offer is. It's a written agreement on the price and terms of purchasing the home. So um, the realtor will draft it up and... If you want an attorney, you being the client, if you want an attorney to go review it, that's on you. And these offers are Colorado State verified and they're like legally binding and it's good to go. But if you want to have a better understanding of what the offer looks like, because there are some legalese in there that the typical consumer and buyer just doesn't know, then yeah, I would say hire an attorney. But I guess just, give you, just to give you an idea, not many people do send it to their attorney. I mean, it's, it's pretty cut and dry on what it means, and I can interpret what the information and language says. Your realtor will write it for you. Show terms, price, deadlines, and more in the written form. So it's just all written. Like It's almost like sending an email where it's like maybe you're on the phone with someone like, okay, let's put in this into writing, make sure that I understand everything, and we're on the same page, literally and figuratively, right? Show terms, price, deadlines, and more in the written form. It's not official until the buyer and realtor sign it. Once both parties are signing it, they send it over or the realtor sends it over to the listing agent or if the seller is selling it on their own without the agent, I would give it to the seller, uh, the actual seller, and then it just works out that way and then they can counter from that, uh, from that point. Make sure you read through it, ask, a real, ask your realtor for advice and also if you want some more information like on the legal aspect of it, make sure you contact your attorney. So anatomy of it, I mentioned it a little bit already, but I do kind of want to dive a little bit deeper. So terms, terms and price over here on this side is probably one of the more important parts of the contracts. So let's say the terms, seller pays for buyer agency. Basically with the new NAR lawsuit, the seller is not obligated to pay for the buyer agent fee because that's how it used to be. But as of, let's say, August of 2024, um, 
the seller can opt out of giving the buyer agent their fee. The uh, buyer will be on the hook if the seller does not want to be on the hook for that. So another thing for the terms, will jacuzzi stay? And I put jacuzzi in quotes because it could be anything. There was a time where we put in an offer on this grand piano that was in the basement and it looked beautiful and it was a great stage piece. And we put an offer of like, hey, we'll put... Uh, an offer of, let's say, 650 grand. Um, if we keep the piano, we'll put an offer at 645K. And so, you know, anything is negotiable in real estate. And that's, that's, that's the fun part, honestly. Uh, seller credits, that can be in the terms as well. Um, the seller can also pay for the closing costs for my buyers. They can also pay for um, a two one buy down, basically lowering the um, the interest rate for the first year or even the second year of the um, of the buyer's rates that they um, that they locked in. So let's say they locked in at seven and a half percent. The buyer can give the or sorry, the seller can give the buyer points or like credits to buy down the rate the first year and the second year. So really useful. Second thing, set deadlines. In the contract, you do set your deadlines. And the tighter the deadline, if the deadlines happen sooner, the more attractive it is to the seller, usually. If they want to move fast, they like to see faster deadlines. If they are sort of like slow and they want to make sure that they find a new property while under contract with this house, communicate with that or communicate that to the seller or communicate that to the buyer. And then they will write that in the contract to accommodate for that, right? So there's more than just price in the whole anatomy of the contract that would make the contract and offer very attractive. So when is the inspection deadline? When will you possess the property? Because there have been times where there's a PCOA or post-closing occupancy agreement where even after closing, the buyer does not move in. The after closing, in the offer, we agreed to let the seller stay for another 30 days or another 60 days before, excuse me, the buyer moves in or takes actual ownership of the house. So just want to let you guys know that. Excuse me. Let, or a third thing, set price. Of course, you got to set the offer price. How much is the earnest money deposit? How much is the loan amount? Um, all of that can be variable. So yeah, Let's say it's a six hundred thousand dollar home. Let's say you put in five hundred k or five hundred eighty k as the actual offer price. Um, you can put in more earnest money to show that the buyer is more um, serious, and the loan amount will determine what the loan financing terms are. Right? Is it a five percent conventional loan? Is it a investment loan of twenty percent down? Things like that. The more money you put down and the more money you put in, in earnest money deposit means that you're more of a serious buyer. You have more skin in the game in that regard. So anything else? Post closing occupancy agreement. And that's what I put in the deadlines, right? Um or at least when I mentioned the deadlines, that's what I mentioned, the PCOA. Appraisal coverage, uh, that was definitely a concern during the really hot market, um, really hot seller's market in 2021 and getting into 2022. Improvements done before closing. If there was something wrong during the inspection, um, sometimes the um, seller would agree to give credits to the buyer or they, well, I'll actually go into this in a different slide, but Will the improvements be done before closing? All of that would be communicated during or within the offer or within a future contract, especially with the inspection um, objection contract. So this is a common issue that people have. But Ian, I can't compete with these high price offers. I would say that I have gotten a lot of deals done, not by price, but because of tighter deadlines and better terms for the seller. If you set the terms for the seller, usually they would allow you to set the price. So if you were to say, hey, I'm gonna put in a 600K offer, but the, uh, the actual list price is 650K, so you put an offer below list price, but you give them tight deadlines, you close within two weeks, it's an all cash offer or something like that, 
that makes it way sweeter for the offer itself. So yeah, tighter deadlines. Quicker close, seller can move on. Give the seller the terms. Give seller the rent buyback if needed. Don't nitpick on inspection. The rent buyback is that PCOA that I mentioned uh, earlier. So the inspection part, there, there's the, yeah, there's that point as well where like, hey, within the offer, we're gonna put an offer at 600K, tighter deadlines, and we're not gonna ask for anything to be repaired or replaced under $500. The only things that we're going to be asking for to be improved or replaced or things like that is if it is health and safety related, which is including the roof, the HVAC, the, let's say any mold issues or uh, the sewer line, things like that. All of that would be included in the, in the inspection objection when, um, yeah, when it's health and safety related. So make it a sweeter deal still. Rent by the back, that PCOA. Seller needs more time to find their home? Perfect. We'll let them stay in their home for another 30 days, completely free. Um, that way they can have more time to move on to the next property and find that property and not have to rush. Higher earnest money deposit. More earnest money means a serious buyer. You, you kind of don't want to work with someone that is not putting in the skin in the game that has nothing to lose, right? You want to work with someone that has something to lose. That way they want to see the transaction reach the closing table. Super important to see. Earnest money and deadlines. So I've said this a couple of times already, but what is earnest money, right? It sets checkpoints for the transaction, both earnest money and deadlines. Earnest money is one of the first things you do once you are under contract. You submit an offer, the seller receives it, they like the terms, they like the price, they like the offer that you sent, they will sign it and now you are under contract, right? One of the first things that needs to happen is that you as the buyer come in with an earnest money deposit. And like I mentioned earlier, higher earnest money deposit is it looks better upon you because you are more serious. That same earnest money will go towards the down payment of your home. So it, let's say the down payment of the home is 30K, right? 30K, if you put in an earnest money deposit of 10K, at the closing table, you only need to bring in 20K. If you put in 15K for the earnest money deposit, you bring in another 15K at the closing table, to accommodate for that 30K down payment total price. Make sense? So, most important deadlines. Earnest money deposit, the very first thing. New loan availability is also important too. Where, let's say, th this is also why it's so important to get pre-approved. And getting pre-approved means um, the lender has seen your tax forms, your income statements, your debts, your monthly payments, everything about you and your record in general, right? And with that, you're pretty much set to go. They give you a budget and if your offer is within and under the uh, purchase price of your offer, then what happens is they're like, if you were to close, let's say within three weeks, you could definitely do that because you're already pre-approved. Like the lender has approved that price for you based on your financials. Inspection. That's another really important deadline, and we'll get into that a little bit later into uh, section five. And then appraisal is also super important as well. Depending on the market, the appraisal can come in higher or lower, and also the condition of the home as well. So the lender only wants to lend on the value of the home, and that's where the appraisal comes in. Because let's say you put a million dollars or like offer a million dollars on a home that's actually worth 200,000, the lender is not gonna give you $800,000 for a $200,000 home. They wanna make sure that they're lending on a proper home that is worth its value. That's where the appraisal comes in. You can get your earnest money back before these deadlines happen. Let's say inspection happens, right? Let's say you put in 10K for your earnest money deposit, right? And so, with that 10K, you got skin in the game. But let's say you can't come into a come to a agreement on inspection and the seller does not want to pursue it. They're like, that's a little bit too much. And you as the buyer are like, whoa, I need this to happen. And if there's just some sort of conflict there, you can still back out 
with your earnest money deposit of that 10K without being dinged, right? Like you just walk away being like, hey, you're not meeting my terms. We're not meeting the middle here. Um, I just don't feel comfortable with it. You can get your earnest money back, which is great. Gives you that sort of self, that sense of confidence going forward, right? Last section of this chapter, inspection and due diligence. That's where the real fun begins. And a lot of the stressors, stressors happen too. And I want to make sure you're prepared for it. So inspections. Showing the property is step one. And as long as it fulfills a lot of your requirements for needs and maybe some wants, this is when you get into the inspection of like, hey, what does the gutter, what do the gutters look like? What is the condition of the fireplace? Um, is the HVAC working correctly? When was the last time the HVAC was even maintained? All of that information would be revealed or at least be very close to that approximation in the, in the inspection, right? Gets in depth look, gets an in-depth look at the property with a certified professional. It's a great way for you to get started and understand the home as best as possible at, with the resources that you have. So you're not going to find everything wrong with the inspection with, especially with the showing. Um, that's like your initial information, initial inspection of the condition of the home, right? Or the layouts or uh, where the garage is and things like that, what the upgrades look like. And even with the inspection, it might give you like 90 to 95% there of what the overall house is operating like and the condition of everything, but you won't find everything. And I'll discuss this a little bit more in a future slide. I, I think even the next one, but just want to give you an idea of what that looks like, um, especially just with the inspection and not setting expectations too high for the inspection as well. So over inspections, usually they cost about 550 to 750 in Colorado, and this includes the sewer scope and radon tests, which I highly recommend getting. So on to the next one. So big ticket items. Um, no, not, so I guess this isn't the one with the additional things that you should look at uh, for inspection, but a little bit of a story time here with uh, this, these pictures of the crawl space. This is of my San Diego home and we just replaced the uh, posts and piers. I think this is the before picture. Um, you can see the posts here um, just being really out of date and just not very secure. Uh, like even mentally speaking, <laughs> I don't think it has too much life in it yet. And, um, I'm, I'm not going to get into the whole story, but eventually it led to, uh, us having to, um, get a post and peer repair done on our foundation, $20,000 later. Um, you know, we got it all done, but eventually, um, it's all worth it because, you know, we got a 30 year warranty um, the foundation is going to be not, not sinking anymore. We're just very happy that we did it eventually, even though at the time it sucked. <laughs> so big ticket items, roof, HVAC, structure, foundation, electrical, sewer, and the inspection or the inspector that comes out um, for the home will give you a general idea of the condition of everything here. HVAC, roof, structure. Um, yeah, so structure and foundation, they're not experts on that, right? They are just going to give you their two cents like, hey, this is a really long crack along the supportive wall or the supportive post. Uh, I would, this is what the inspector would say. The inspector would say, I would recommend a professional come out here and go check it out. And same with the electrical and possibly the sewer, but they will do a sewer scope to give you an idea of what that looks like where they pretty much shove a long camera and the camera is on a hose and they just shove it in there to see the condition of everything and the material that is uh, lining the sewer line. For example, clay is really old and it can break and it you know it has cracks and especially with settling of soil. Um, or let's say PVC, which is a lot more modern. It has a lot more durability. It's like that hard polyurethane, you know, polyvinyl chloride. That's PVC. Um, chemical makeup to make it last a really long time. So yeah, those are the big ticket items. Uh, you can negotiate hard for these items to be repaired or replaced. Um, 
I mean, if you don't want to deal with a $10,000 sewer uh, line replace, then, you know, hey, let's negotiate for it. Um, we could back out easily as long as we meet the deadlines, um, depending on how these, uh, how, what the condition of the sewer is, right? So yeah, just wanted to let you know that you're not, once you put an offer and it gets accepted, you are not on the hook to buy it. You can leave it. Although the fact that you put in an offer means that you enjoy and like the layout and a lot of the big picture items. So if we could fix those little things, if we could fix the smaller or even the big ticket items, I think it can work out for you, right? So of course, every instance is very unique. So if you can't meet an agreement, you can back out with the earnest money uh, deposit. It has to be before the inspection deadline though. So make sure you know the deadlines. It has to happen before that stuff. And usually your realtor um, makes the inspection happen at least several days before the inspection objection and inspection resolution. I'm not going to get into that a little bit or uh, during this section, but um, yeah, it will depend on even your state information as well. So um, have that conversation with your realtor on it. So here's a couple of pictures of what it's like to look at an inspection or inspection report. So here we have satisfactory, fair, uh, P for poor, NA for not applicable, NI is not inspected. So um, they're never going to say something is good. Once they say something is good, um, they're, they're on the hook for liability, which is why S is here for satisfactory. So the ceiling in this case is fair. And, you know, it's of decent condition. Like for us lay people, this is a very decent looking roof. Um, but according to the, uh, the inspection, it gives you some reasons why. Bad drywall seams, normal issues associated with drywall finishes at the surface. Um, chipped, scuffed, and warm paint noted throughout the house. This is a cosmetic issue for your information. Have the interior paint have the interior painted as needed. So interior of the ceiling, I guess. I'm not sure what that means exactly. Um, either way, several nail pops. That's the thing too. Um, so yeah, looking at this too, some of it is satisfactory. Some of it is fair, but it can be poor as well. But the house that I took this report from is, um, you know, it seemed like it was in pretty good condition. Um, this is a important piece of information from the, from the inspection. Remember when I said in a previous slide saying that you could put in the offer saying that we will not bother you for small things. We're not going to bother you with nitpicky things. Let's say a leaky faucet that's dripping. I'm sure it's just like tightening a bolt here and there. What could be the issue or things that you could uh, have bigger issues with or things that you would report on the inspection resolution where you have the seller address it is big ticket items. Let's say the foundation, the sewer lines, plumbing, electrical, things like that. Rain gutters is a small thing that you have to worry about. This is not an issue. Um, of course, it's an inconvenience and you know, you as a homeowner could probably find this to be to your advantage of having to work with this, learn about your gutters, how to fix it and things like that. And that's just normal maintenance required for you to have a proper home. So don't sweat the petty things is what I'm trying to say. You want to save all your ammo for the big ticket items. And once you go for this nitpicky stuff, the seller will start to see you as troublesome and they're not going to be as willing to work with you on the big ticket items, at least in my opinion and what I've seen before. Inspection additions. This is the information that, or the, um, what do you call it? The additional things that you should inspect or could inspect based on the condition of the home. So this is the uh, extra um, inspections that you could do with a certified professional. I highly recommend my clients do a sewer scope. Have the camera snake from your clean out to the city. It's $150 for some valuable information. Because trust me, using $150 for the uh, sewer scope and finding something wrong with it 
you can get thousands of dollars in repairs or replacements of the sewer line just for that $150 um, inspection. So I highly recommend it, and it would also determine the lifetime of the sewer when it comes, uh, when the, um, the use or the, the life of the sewer line is ending is what I'm trying to say. Are having planning or plan on having renters in the basement get a radon test done, especially if there are initially no egress windows. Radon is an interesting element. Um, it can be a carcinogen, meaning it can cause cancer if it just if it gets left in the basement. So it's a little bit heavier than the atmospheric. Uh, composition so it stays in the basement and it just sits there right so if people are living there if people are working from home there they are, are exposed to this radon like for hours on end so this radon test determines how much radon there is at that given point and of course like opening a window definitely reduces the amount of radon uh, in that basement area that because it just circulating air right but radon mitigation systems are pretty affordable. You're looking at 1200 bucks. If the radon test comes in higher, it's not the end of the world. You can negotiate for a radon mitigation system. Very important to know. Um, it's just one of those things that seem a big deal, but in actuality, there's an easy fix to it. Open all the windows. Let's say the radon test comes high, open all the windows, get the air flowing, and then make sure you install a radon mitigation system. It's about 1200 bucks. Not, not too crazy. Inspection. Structural damage can be found in the initial home inspection, but you'll need to get a professional to get a better idea on the cost and condition. There's a lot of variables with foundations. Um, I would say, uh, yes, get to a professional to go look at the property and see what the initial cost would be. I mean, you're looking, I mean, structural, it's always a bigger concern, right? You're looking at what, 10K, 20K, maybe even 30K, depending on the damage that has been done or will be done. And if you can get it done or get it replaced or fixed before any more damage gets done, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So definitely worth it for your knowledge. Lastly, mold can be a huge issue if not dealt with properly and quickly. Although not common, if you have concerns, call a professional. The, unless there's like a wet spot in the drywall, the inspector, the initial home inspector will not be looking for mold. I mean, or let's say there's black mold in the, uh, in the bathroom, like close to the vents. It's not going to be a concern because it's easily removable, right? Um, if you have doubts, if you think that there's mold behind the tiles or beneath the walls or something like that, get a professional in there. They can test it. They will give you remediation ideas. They will dry it out. Um, and you know, it, it's if you catch it while the while you're under contract, you can work out that information with um, the seller. So it is worth it. <laughs> I definitely, yeah. If you have any sort of concerns, let's say if, hey, this is very close to a water line and I see some leaks here, we should definitely get a whole mold inspector to go check this out. Uh, it is definitely worth it to go check it, like get a home inspection uh, of a more certified professional in that regard. So, what do home inspections do not cover? <laughs> What do home inspections not cover? Uh, and I'm talking about the initial ones, right? Uh, where it's just sort of surficial and nothing too crazy. Instances of lead-based paint. You need to hire, um, I know some home inspectors have like a uh, XRF machine that detects if there's lead-based paint. Um, I mean, even then LBP is not a concern. Just don't eat it and don't have kids eat it, right? And if it's under a layer of paint, let's say you paint over it, that's fine as well. Um, but like I said, I'm not a professional in that regard, but that's just what I have seen and what have experienced, uh, especially as a previous environmental consultant. Um, LBP is not a huge issue. Asbestos, as long as you're not like making it airborne, you know, like popcorn ceiling, sure you can scrape it off and like put it into a garbage bag and you can find contractors to do that for you. It can be considered a hazardous material. So 
make sure you um, get someone who is a professional to handle asbestos, especially with hazardous waste. Mold, another thing, we mentioned that already. Flooding and FEMA areas. You, there is additional insurance that comes with flooding and FEMA areas. Um, if your home or potential home is in a FEMA insured area, you might need to get flood insurance. And depending on whether you're in a 50 year zone or 100 year zone, uh, your insurance can go up depending on where you're at within those zones. Uh, swimming pools. Yes, you do want to get a pool inspection done, um, whether it's the proper amount of chlorine, the filters are working and things like that. Um, there's not too many pools in the Denver area, but um, yeah, I would say get a professional. Pests like termites, mice, squirrels living in the house, they can make a home in your insulation. Uh, it's nice and toasty in there. They love it. Um which is like in the attic portion of the house, especially if you have a pitched roof. Um, yeah, so termites are not too common in the Denver area because they freeze uh, in the winter. So they're not as common. Mice are common-ish and uh, squirrels are common as well. So make sure you go check that out. Uh, goal, fixing the problem. So when you do encounter these problems in the home, what does that look like, right? Um or like, how do you fix that problem? So what happens is you can do one of three things. You can lower the purchase price. So with that, you're just literally lowering the price of the home. Often, often cases, not the best solution. Month, the monthly payment is mostly unaffected. You're looking at, let's say, every $10,000 that you're decreasing off the purchase price, it's maybe 100 to $150 per month that you're saving, which is not hugely uh, influential or significant. So let's look at the other two options. You can ask for seller credits. It's like flexible cash. You can use it towards your closing costs. You can use it towards, um, lowering your rates. Um, there's a lot of ways you could use the seller credits for, um, like for your advantage. And it's an easy way to get the deal moving forward. It's just, um, almost like, a uh, like a, like a catch all almost, uh, limited to the amount of seller credits the buyer can ask for. So with a, let's say five percent, five percent conventional loan. Um, let's say, yeah, you're house hacking it. You want to use a conventional loan. You can only ask for 3% of the purchase price. So let's say the purchase price is $600,000. 3% of that is about $18,000. So you can only ask for a grand total of $18,000 in seller credits uh, by the closing table. And then lastly, the seller fixes the problem, which is kind of cool because um, it's fixed. It's all done. It's great. The thing is, is that there's a catch. Seller appointed contractor, right? Of course, you could do your due diligence and have uh, some negotiation of having your contractor out there to go check it out and deem the fix and um, get it all done. Um, so there is a way to get around this con here. Uh, with this pro though, I mean, what's great about it is that it's fixed prior to you owning the property as long as you get like the invoice, the work that was done, um, the job sheets and uh, like a receipt for everything that was done. That is, I, I like this option, but seller credits is probably the most popular and easiest way to get the deal moving forward. So let's say, Hey, in our inspection, the refrigerator ice machine doesn't work. A uh, seller could just say, okay, we'll give you $2,000 in seller credits. Great. That pays for a whole new fridge. <laughs> so that is, um, that's definitely a way for you to, um, make this a little bit more attractive. So last thing I want to point out, because that's the end of the whole video. Um, remember everything is negotiable. Whether you're working with a hard seller or a, um, I don't know, HOA is giving you a hard time where they're not giving you the proper documents before closing time, everything is negotiable. So we can get a little bit more creative into how this all works, but I'll just leave it at this for now and talk it out, get creative, because that's my favorite part about real estate is that there are multiple solutions to one problem. 
So that being said, keep in touch with me. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, I am on youtube.com, invest in Denver. I provide a lot of information on the Denver markets, house hacking, investing, all that good stuff. I need to update this on Instagram. I am ian.househacker. Excuse me, I'm trying to niche down a little bit. Ian C. Jimeno at gmail.com. And I'm also on school. If you're seeing this on school already, welcome. And um, it's a free community. Go check it out. I think you'll find some really good information there and you can find me on there regularly and you can crowdsource all the information or questions that you have about house hacking and investing in real estate. So that being said, thanks so much for watching guys. Um, this is just part three. There's gonna be four, five, six, and seven coming up, but I appreciate your time and thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.